good morning, everybody. It is good to see you. Happy Sunday to you. Let me take just a minute and just say thank you for all of the contributions and the supplies that you as a church has been helping us to support our local mission. I am proud of the work that you guys have done. So thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much. We are taking the whole month of August and collecting supplies, uh, shampoo, soaps, uh, box canned goods, all of that to stock in our local mission. And you guys have done an amazing job of that. So I wanted to take a minute and say thank you. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching the news lately, but you have seen how much religious freedom has been in the news. And I wanted to take this opportunity to do a little bit of a standalone sermon and talk about our religious freedom. Welcome back. Tonight, a California church is fighting back against the cease and desist order. Harvest Rock Church in Pasadena is requesting a preliminary injunction against California Governor Gavin Newsom over his COVID-19 orders, which church attorneys call unconstitutional. On Sunday, Harvest Rock Church joined other California houses of worship, violating Golden State restrictions on singing, chanting, and indoor attendance. Another church defying those state orders? Grace Community Church near Los Angeles. And joining us now, the Reverend John MacArthur, pastor of Grace Community Church in Sun Valley near LA. Pastor MacArthur, welcome to Faith Nation. Pastor, first off, you called the Sunday worship service a peaceful protest. Were you drawing a comparison to what appears to be a loophole, presumably since outdoor peaceful protests are allowed? Yeah, that's the obvious reality here in California, as it is all the way across the country. Uh, nobody wants to shut down a protest. Uh, may start out peaceful, could easily turn into a riot. In fact, last week here in L.A., there were protests five days in a row. Uh, nobody seemed to care whether anybody kept social distance or whether they wore masks. Uh, the rules don't apply to them, um, but they apply to a church. And so... If we can call ourselves a protest, we should. We're the original protesters. We're Protestants. We've been doing this for 500 years. So uh, that was a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek uh, way of saying, if they can meet without any repercussions, why can't we? And why do you think that distinction has been drawn? Well, I, I think because churches. the culture, the climate, is to allow protest, uh, even to foment protest. I think there are people in power in our country who are behind protests. I, I think they don't even mind, obviously, when those protests turn into riots, damage is done. You, you see across our country uh, that there's an unwillingness to stop this in many of our cities. So there's an agenda going on to allow this kind of disruption to tear down institutions that people hate and detest. Um, and reality would tell us this, that the world is hostile against the Church of Jesus Christ particularly those that are faithful in proclaiming his gospel. Jesus said, if they hated me, they, they'll hate you. That's just how it is. And obviously we've had a couple hundred years of a, a good relationship with the government, but it's not surprising given the climate today that they're beginning to turn even on faithful churches. Pastor, I want to ask you, uh, you know, most Christians would agree that churches are essential, but they've also been characterized as super spreader venues. Pastor, how much should churches and church leaders like yourself comply with the government to play a part in bringing California's recent surge to heal? Well, I think the obvious way to answer that is to say that when the uh, first initial model came out and we were told that millions were going to die, we did what any common sense people would do. We we shut down the church and I preached live stream to an empty auditorium. I did that for weeks and eventually the people started coming back. We didn't invite them, we didn't tell them to do that. They, they began to realize that the predictions were way off. In fact, as of now, uh, we've had about 10,000 deaths in California out of 40 million people. So you have a 99.98 uh, chance that you're gonna survive this just fine. The people get that. They understand that. They're moving around in our culture. The freeways are busy again. Uh, people are moving around and they're they're connecting with each other. They're, they're right. just starting to come back to normal life. So far, we don't have anybody in our church, and we had 7,000 people here last Sunday that we know of who is sick. I haven't seen or heard of anybody in our church in, in the hospital. So they just don't believe the narrative. 
we we are not going to do something that's dangerous to our people or any others. But at the same time, our folks and many, many other people whose churches are closed are deciding to come to Grace Church. And that's an adult decision that they that they make weighing the realities that they know are true. Pastor, we only have about a minute left, uh, if you can. I understand the city issued a cease and desist order and threatened the church with a daily $1,000 fine and possible arrest. Can you explain why you believe it's important to take this stand? What's at stake here? Well, what's at stake, first of all, is the reality that Christ is the head of the church. Is this anything new? Don't we as believers make heroes out of people who stood against tyrants throughout church history? This started in the book of Acts when they told the apostles not to preach. And the apostles said, you judge whether we obey God or men. Uh, that, that should be obvious to you. So this is nothing new for the church. It's new in our country. Faithful churches, faithful pastors have always realized Jesus Christ is Lord and head of his church. We follow him. Wonderfully, the Constitution allows us that privilege and demands that our leaders protect that privilege. All right, Grace Community Church's John MacArthur. Pastor MacArthur, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. We've come through the book of Acts. We've seen the first six chapters from Pentecost in chapter 2 all the way to Stephen and his stoning in chapter 6 of the book of Acts. We've watched the persecution of the church after Jesus Christ had died and ascended. And so we were learning how the apostles dealt with that opposition and that persecution. And you have seen that across the country, uh, many of our churches uh, have, uh, depending what state you are in, has to battle some of that contention with religious freedom. I've been particularly watching a church out in California uh, and how they are dealing with the state on this. And so I thought you know, it's a good opportunity this morning to just kind of give a primer Sorry, we're recording this in the midst of a storm right now, so we've already taken a cut and come back. But this is a primer on the First Amendment and religious freedom. So the question really is, how does the U.S. Constitution protect religious freedom in America? Well, Isaac Backus, a leading Baptist preacher during the American Revolutionary Era, observed that religious matters are to be separated from the jurisdiction of the state, not because they are beneath the interest of the state, but quite the contrary, because they are too high and holy and therefore are beyond the competence of the state. Now, Isaac Back Backus said that he was a colonial Baptist from New England way back in 1773. Now, based on the unique nature of religion and why they came to America from England in the first place to escape religious persecution, the founding fathers, the colonies in America, drafting the First Amendment, wisely treated religion and religious beliefs differently from other forms of expression to ensure the protection of religious freedom. To do so, they place special restrictions on religion. But importantly, they also provided religion with special constitutional protections. And I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. These special restrictions that were written by our founders and put into the Constitution are important to revisit. The first 16 words of the First Amendment, and I'm going to read them to you, they are called the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, that's the First Amendment in the United States Constitution, written in December 15, 1791. 
taken together, these clauses are often referred to as the Constitution's religion clauses. Each of these clauses separates religion and government in ways that protect individual religious freedom and ensure the integrity of both religion and government. The Establishment Clause. This clause prohibits a joining between government and religion, such as no official state religion, no preference by government of one faith over another, or religion generally, no taxes to support religion, and no government support for religious worship or practice. That's actually one of the reasons why we did not take the funding that was coming out at, when the coronavirus started. And then there's the free exercise clause that provides each individual with the right to freely practice the religion of his or her choosing. It ensures the autonomy, houses of worship, and other religious institutions from government in matters of internal governance and religious law. It prohibits government from enacting laws that specifically target religion. And I think some of that is going on out in California. So the United States Constitution uh, has clauses in there, such as the Religious Text Clause, and it prohibits any kind of religious test for citizens to hold elected public office or to be a public official or employee. And that's found in Article 6 of the Constitution. And that clause states, no religious test shall be ever required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. So there you have what is written in the United States Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land. Now, I wanted to read from the uh, Baptist Faith and Message that you can find the link on our website and go to that. It talks about our statement of faith and all that we believe and our doctrines, etc., etc. But in Article 17, it says, God alone is the Lord of the conscience, and He has left it free from the doctrines and the commandments of men which are contrary to His word or not contained in it. Church and state should be separate. The state owes to every church protection and full freedom in the pursuit of its spiritual ends. In providing for such freedom, no ecclesiastical group or denomination should be favored by the state more than any others. Civil government being ordained of God, it is the duty of Christians to render loyal obedience thereto in all things not contrary to the revealed will of God. The church should not resort to civil power to carry on its work, and we should never have to use the government's funding. Now, it is the will of God that the people of God, according to the goodness of their hearts in each local congregation, they are solely responsible for their church, their church's service to the community, its financial welfare, and meeting the ministerial needs to preach, teach, and train, to make disciples, and to fulfill the great commission and the great commandment. Commandment That is done by each local assembly, and some churches may handle that differently. Um, the Roman Catholics are probably in a different category than we are. But that's the gospel. I mean, that's where we are as far as church goes and how God intended the church to function and work. And the gospel of Christ contemplates spiritual means alone for the pursuit of its ends. Therefore, the state has no right to impose penalties for religious opinions of any kind. The state has no right to impose taxes for the support of any form of religion. A free church in a free state is the Christian ideal, and this implies the right of the free and unhindered access to God on the part of all men and the right to form and propagate opinions in the sphere of of religion without interference of civil power. Now, I have a plethora of scriptures that you could come see me on in this area. But as we delve into the topic this morning, I want to begin where all of our studies should begin, and that is the Holy Word of God. All studies that we are looking at always begin with the scripture. What biblical foundations do we have for espousing the position 
of religious liberty set forth in Article 17 of our Baptist faith and message. Like many other ethical positions, um, they're drawn from Scripture as a whole. So I want to give you a couple um, that I've pulled and selected. There's many more, but I'm going to give you a couple. Now, Jesus tells us that He is the author of freedom, both of conscience and of worship. When in John 8, verse 32, it says this, You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And in chapter 8, verse 36, where He says, If the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. So Jesus clearly separates the church and the state. Also in Matthew twenty two twenty one, 21, where he says, Render or give to Caesar the things that are Caesar, but give to God the things that are God's. The Apostle Paul had something to say about this topic as well. Paul instructs the Christians in Ephesus in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Um, and he's um, um, chapter 2, the first two verses, to live in harmony with the government, even to pray for our leaders. He says, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Now, you're not watching churches hold protests. And we are to cooperate and to get along the best we can with those in authority over us. Even the Apostle Peter spells it out a little bit more clearly in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, when he says, Submit to every human institution because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors or those sent out by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good, for it is God's will that you, by doing good, silence the ignorance of foolish people. As God's slaves, live as free people, but don't use your freedom in a way to conceal evil. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So, of course, Romans 13 clearly tells us that Christians, we have a responsibility to submit to the authorities that God has placed over us, that God has ordained government to punish the evildoers in the land and to reward those who do good. When the law of the land goes against the Bible, well, we must obey God rather than man. So what you're seeing around the nation today uh, there are some things that have unfolded. Each state seems to be a little different by law. Each governor seems to be a little bit different as well. Fortunately for us here in the state of Florida, we're not having that issue. But our other brothers and sisters in Christ are battling these things. So I want to take a look at religious freedom. And, you know, we believe in religious liberty. And it's the end of that Article 17 in the Baptist Faith and Message on our website, www.thrivechurchfl.com. It has the affirmation that God alone is the Lord of the conscience. This conviction is at the very heart of all religious liberty, the idea that God is alone the Lord of the conscience, the one who is in His Word, tells us what to believe and practice. And simply stated, religious liberty is the right of every person to worship God or not as they see fit without any interference from the government, but under the direction of God to whom all of us will give an account. One of the great Southern Baptist preachers of the last century or so was George W. Truett. Um, he has been quoted lately many, many times, and I'm quoting him today. At the time, this pastor was first uh, pastor of First Baptist Church of Dallas. But in 1920, Truett delivered a sermon from, of all places, the steps of the United States Capitol, if you can imagine that. And as he stood there preaching somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people, he summed up what most Southern Baptists believe religious liberty is, and many other Christian denominations as well. Truett said, It is the natural and fundamental and indefeasible right of every human being to worship God or not, 
according to the dictates of his conscience, and as long as he does not infringe upon the rights of others, he is to be held accountable alone to God for all religious beliefs and practices. Now, our contention is not for mere toleration, but for absolute freedom. There is a wide difference between toleration and liberty. Toleration is a gift from man, while liberty is a gift from God. And folks, God wants free worshipers and no other kind. He doesn't want forced worshipers. God wants free worshipers. Now, we do not believe people should be forced to worship God, nor do we believe that they should be in any way kept from worshiping God. So as Christians, we have long been uh, champions of this kind of religious freedom, and the book of Acts is notorious because that's where persecution began when the church was launched, when they told those apostles, stop preaching about Jesus Christ. To which they responded, you decide whether we ought to honor men and God, but we are going to honor God over man. And so it was a great response. And so um, I think it's important to understand that. Um, look, we, we believe in the separation of church and state. And while we define separation of church and state in one way, the secularists in our country have interpreted it another way, using it as an excuse to exclude any mention of Christianity from the public square. This is not what we mean. As we seek to define the separation of church and state, there are several things that need to be considered. And I am pulling from an article through the Baptist Faith and Message, and I thought it was important enough to share, so these aren't my words, but I found it very profound, and I am repeating them. We believe that it is our God-given right to express our religious and moral views and to worship free from any government interference. This includes our children wearing T-shirts to school with religious messages on them without being penalized by godless and ignorant school officials. It includes the right of our children to pray wherever and whenever they desire without school officials illegally penalizing them for exercising their freedom of speech and their freedom of religion. It includes our ability to share the gospel of Jesus Christ without being labeled as intolerant or terrorist because we hold that Jesus is the only way to heaven. One of the foundational tenets of our faith is the exclusivity of Jesus as the only way to salvation. Increasingly, what we see as being the good news, the world sees and holds as bigotry and intolerance. Religious liberty means the state has an obligation to protect our right to believe and preach and teach whatever we like. It includes us exerting any political influence that we may have as Christians to see candidates elected, that we hold our beliefs. Citizens who happen to be Christians should not be silenced as they seek to exercise their freedom of speech simply because that which they choose to speak is from a decidedly Christian world view. Christians or any other religious group, for that matter, should not be penalized because they seek to place people in office who best represent their views. This is, after all, the basis of representative government. Increasingly, we are seeing this idea propagated, which says that all views are valid, unless, of course, it is a Christian point of view. This is contrary to what we believe, and for the record, is contrary to what the founders of this country envisioned when they wrote the First Amendment. So governments shouldn't censor the pulpits. As the moral tide of our country falls, increasingly preachers who stand against immorality and wickedness and evil of all kinds will become the targets, unnecessary targets. And Jesus did not look to the Roman authorities to further his kingdom. Neither did the disciples, nor did Paul. 
the most prolific writer among all the apostles. In fact, Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world. We did not believe civil government should be used to carry on the work of the church. Christians have a responsibility to the state, yes. Nowhere is there more clearly seen in the issue of abortion and homosexuality in this country. As Christians, while we are to submit to the government's authority, our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus Christ and the very truth of His Word in the Holy Bible. In Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John were ordered by the Sanhedrin to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, Peter and John answered, as I gave you a moment ago, in verses 19 and 20, whether it is right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide, for we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. In Acts chapter 5, after, after having been arrested for continuing to preach Jesus, Peter said we must obey God rather than men. Philippians 3 verse 20 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. When the laws of man violate the laws of God as citizens of heaven, we must obey the laws of God. A free church in a free state is the Christian ideal. It's important that we all understand uh, our ultimate protection is in the United States Constitution. And that is the supreme law of the land, and that's why I'm able to preach today to you in your living room. And that's why we are churches all over this nation, all over this land, exercising our First Amendment right. The supreme law of the land is a term best described as the highest form of law a nation can have. It is the foundation upon which all other laws are built upon and legally established. For the United States of America, the supreme law of the land is the Constitution. Federal laws and all treaties, unless they are in direct conflict with the Constitution itself. The Constitution is therefore the founding pillar of the entire political existence of the United States of America. Now, in that is a supremacy clause. And where this is actually established, it is in Clause 2 of Article 6 in the United States Constitution. The common nickname for that section is the Supremacy Clause, which is also the only place this term is ever used in the entire Constitution. It says that the federal government is supreme over the state laws and thus all state judges are obligated to uphold the clause. This is true even in situations of conflict with the state laws. You see, the Supremacy Clause is meant to regulate any possible legal conflicts, i.e. the shared governance between national law and state law. However, the federal government or the states address anything they plan on doing they are always under the authority of the Constitution. This doesn't mean the state laws do not hold any bargain. As long as they are abiding the national laws, they can authorize policies on health care, education, and taxes just like the federal government can. Now this relation between the federal government and the state was clearer in the past. Still, ever since the 1860s, and the American Civil War, the exclusive and concurrent powers of federal and state began overlapping. Even today, the questions of federalism in the United States is the source of much controversy and many dilemmas. Questions about the control of health care and education, for example, are one of those controversial topics. So when I think about our Christian brother, John MacArthur and Grace Community Church, there's an importance to understand that in the very beginning, we all complied with our local government and our federal government and our state government until we began to see the data coming out and be able to see the differences that were taking place. And when we began to see the unfairness 
of many gambling casinos and establishments that were allowed to be open, but the restrictions were coming down in some states on different churches. I think it's important to understand as far back, believe it or not, as the writing of the Magna Carta back in 1215, that's where the phrase came from, the law of the land. And its term is used in that document, the Magna Carta. Since it was written in Latin, Magna Carta uses the term lex terre, which translates to the law of the land in English. It was more than 500 years later, soon after the American Revolution, that the legislators embraced the Magna Carta's description of the law of the land and other ideals represented in the document. In the year, finally, in the year 1787, the term was used to establish the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution, which I read to you a moment ago. In conclusion, it is God who has given us freedom. It's God who's given us faith. It's God who's given us the family. And we live in the United States of America. I think it's still one of the greatest countries on this planet. And I believe that we ought to honor that Constitution that protects our religious freedom. It is still the supreme law of the land. The only higher law is the Holy Bible. At the end of the day, we have to say that religious freedom is both a blessing and a curse. The blessing is that religious freedom affords us the privilege to worship God as we wish, where we wish, with whom we wish, without fear of punishment, without fear of discipline or reprisal. While we acknowledge this as a God-given right, it is nonetheless a very unique phenomena and very unique to a country. Looking back over the course of history, few people have ever had such religious freedom as those of us do here as citizens of the United States of America. The problem, the curse, the downside is that it's taken for granted. And it, it could become like a curse, like a, a child who was reared on a trust fund and never learned to work, therefore never learning the true value of money. And many Americans today have no concept of how truly precious and unique our religious freedom is. Taking it for granted, they will fall and fail to protect it against the encroaching tide of secularism that is swiftly rising in our land. As Christians, we must let our voices be heard. As salt and light in our culture, we must be faithful to the responsibility that God has given us. And I think the best way to do that is to vote as your civic duty in this election. Vote for those who uphold our freedoms and who best represent our values. Exercise our religious liberty by getting involved in the local church and winning our country to Christ one soul at a time. So I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me this morning. Um, I value my constitutional right of religious freedom. And that is what we are at war and fighting today because there are those that would take that freedom away from us. May God bless you. May God have his hands upon you. May you enjoy the freedom that God has given you to pray to him this day. God bless.